first of all, thank you, Walker. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all the time and everything that you have done for Mastermind and the, your whole community is here. Your community is here. Um, it's fantastic. And thank you for Intellect Team. Thank you, everybody, for, for participating on this fireside chat as well. And we'll, we'll definitely open up a lot more questions and more discussions around it. Yeah. But um, like it, it's very, uh, like it's our honor to have you here. No, it's a pleasure. It's my, my pleasure. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's kick start the discussion. Again, I don't want to go into litmus to honest just yet. But looking at Hanover Messer right now. Yeah. Uh, looking at every different vendors that you are seeing. How do you think UNS revolutionizes them? How do you think more data driven innovations revolutionizes them? What do you think about it? So uh, there's three primary observations I've made. So yeah. I've only walked the floor a, a little bit because I've been in a lot of meetings. But um, number one, I, it's really surprising how far behind um, the European Union is in digital transformation. Hey, huh? all due respect, but coming from the States, um, it's almost as if uh, in the EU they're trying to over-engineer digital solutions and rather than starting with the problem and you know just getting started and iterating. Um, it's almost as if they're, they're trying to over-engineer and I, and I see that in a lot of the products. Um, as it relates to UNS, obviously Unified Namespace is everywhere, everyone's got it on their loop and I do just go up and ask people what is UNS, if they've got it there I'll just ask them, hey, what is Unified Namespace? <laughs> Um, most of the people here get it right, so that means um, there are a couple of people who couldn't answer the question. But most of the vendors, if you see UNS, I mean, they're, they, they understand what it is. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is just the sheer number of people, like how the message, yeah. you know, what it is that we've been trying to convey to industry for, since 2018, how that's spread all over the world is, it's really overwhelming. I mean, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm an introvert by nature. I know it's hard to believe. Like, I'm, I'm only in front of the camera because humility is one of our core values. And humility is knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at. And I know that I'm good in front of a camera and that I'm a good speaker. And so, therefore, it's my responsibility to spread the message. But it is very uncomfortable for me um, to be on stage. It's not normal for me. I put, a, put on a brave face. And when... You know, the, all the people, I mean, I, we've had, I, I mean, hundreds of people have stopped and say hi and tell their story, and it's overwhelming. It really, it, it's, it, the, the community that's been built is, it's profound. It really, it, 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 uh, it moves me to tears almost, honestly, because this whole mission started out by trying to save and create middle class jobs, and the unified namespace, that architecture that I first started trying to develop and 2003 and implemented in 2005, that was to solve my own problem. It wasn't, it was, I'm working a salt mine, I have to cover seven miles of conveyor and, and process facilities and hoists and I can't be everywhere all at once. Why is it I have to drive three miles to go check an e-stop on a conveyor when I, all that data should be in one place and anybody should be able to access it? That was to solve my own problem, and at every stop, I just implemented a unified namespace infrastructure, a single source of truth, semantically organized, showing current state of the organization. And that turned into, you know, a, a, we, we, I built this, the, the largest standalone SCADA system in the world in 2013, a, a team of 16 developers. It took us 18 months, um, $1.6 million. It was 14,000 locations, 40,000 devices, 11 million tags, 2,000 concurrent users, 2 million daily alarms across five states. We did it in 18 months. The next closest bid was $50 million. We did it for 1.6, and everybody was like, how the fuck, you know, how did you, how did you do it for 1.6? And, and the answer was everything we teach in Mastermind, unified namespace, iterative approach, small, short sprints, solve the problem, move on to the next problem. And when we won the Firebrand Award for that, that kind of changed everything. It was like everybody knew who we were and they started to listen and it's turned into this. It's yeah. crazy. 100%. And, and you are underselling it. Like, uh, like since last two days, um, like people from Europe, people from US, uh, somebody from Brazil, somebody from Japan, Tokyo, 
they all come here and then they say, do you find namespace? Oh, explain me how do you find namespace works. So um, it's, it, 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 it's almost a moment now. Um, we were just talking um, one minute ago. I didn't know who you were, so I was just trying to sell her unified names, <laughs> but she's, she, she's more expert in it. But the, the, the idea is there's a citizen developer population which is popular. Yeah. It's like everybody needs to be empowered. And you're not just a person who is loading truck. You need data to load trucks faster. How do you enable that person to have that data-driven innovation, data-driven daily, daily activities that they're doing is, is, is critical. And unified namespace gives them a way out which is, I don't have to worry about legacy systems on the one side, I'm just going to access the, the data out of my consolidated single source of code, and I use it in a way that I want to use, rather than what corporate wants me to use. Exactly. And and that, again, I'm just from my experience in the last two days here, everybody's asking about it. Yeah. So you are grossly underselling it by saying that <laughs> like some people are interested, no, everybody's interested. So fundamental, in my mind, fundamental reason for it is, is definitely a brand new approach, which is breaking the mold. Yeah. And people will keep on But you know, it's crazy, like, so Intel integration that's represented here, which is my integration firm, I, I don't have anything to do with the day-to-day -day operations of Intel anymore. I'm at 4.0 Solutions and I teach. I, for the last three years, I have been doing nothing but proselytizing and teaching what it is Intel does. When you guys are in mentorship and you take the step one practical, that is literally the exact same practical our engineers take in order to come work for us. So it's literally the same program. Everything we teach is everything we operate on in our company. But I don't have anything to do with that integrator. I, I just teach for, th for three years. That's all I've been doing is traveling the world and speaking. And you know, the re you want to know why UNS has taken off, honestly? You know, I'll just be frank with you. Um, you know, we, you know, some of the big players got beat really bad and lost tens of millions of dollars in contracts because they they were losing $10 million bids to $1 million bids because they were approaching the solution wrong. And that $1 million bid was based on the UNS, and the $10 million bid was based on the old legacy Industry 3 approach of solving problems, which is huge capex on the front end, try to write a specification at, at the beginning of a project my whole career I've said, you don't know what you want until the end of the project. Yeah. It, the, the idea that you would capitalize $10 million to digitalize an organization up front is preposterous. You do not know, you don't know enough to sign a check for $10 million. But what we've always said was, start with a 12 week proof of concept. The truth is you can do it in six weeks but you need the first six weeks to get off the ground. Right. So it's a 12 week proof of concept that helps educate the customer. The customer gets smarter. And then what the customer wants as they get smarter changes. Like think about it, the, the, the smarter you get, you know, you've been nose diving in this, right? For a couple of years now, right? And it's, as you learn more and more about what digital is, your eye, your vector gets broader and broader and broader. The same thing happens with our clients. And there must be an architecture that supports that. Unified Namespace was designed to do that. It continues to grow. We're going to be releasing a public broker that shows a unified namespace over time, a genealogy of a unified namespace over time. I've showed you guys a mastermind, but it's going to be public for the whole world. Yeah. And you're going to be able to see six phases of digital transformation, how a unified namespace grows typically. Yeah. And I think when most people see that, the light bulb will go off. Oh, shit, that's how it works. But you know what really happened here? The big players got beat, and Bar Gartner said we couldn't ignore it any longer. We got to write it. We we need to write something about UNS, and they did. In June of last year, Microsoft. You know, I'm not beating up Microsoft here, but Microsoft realized that Azure IoT was shit. It was garbage. Nobody was buying it because they approached it wrong, and they threw it out and they started from scratch. And guess what they built? Something that would support unified namespace. So Gartner wrote a paper last June, Microsoft rebuilt Azure IoT to support UNS, and it all took off. But the point is, we've been, I've been preaching this since 2018, to the world, and it took that long. That's how slow our industry moves. Think about that. Yeah. Five and, years. Five years. And, and that, that's so cool. Okay, Nikos was founded in 2015. In the first few years, it was all non-repeatable approaches. Right. We had data. So Nikos Edge had all the data on the plant floor. But 
up until we launched or understood the concept and applied the concepts that it has to be single source of truth, it was never repeatable. And in the story on um, you don't know everything became more and more relevant in times of AI. Yeah. Like last week, there were six AI new AI models were launched. There was a bunch of uh, small language models, LLM were launched, or some some open source models were launched. Like uh, there is a there is a fundamentally different way to consume that data every single day. Model number one would give you reasoning. Model number two will give you analytics on a time series data itself. So why limit yourself to a one-to-one -one architecture when consumers are changing all the time? When you were speaking up here earlier, you you pointed, I don't know, it was on a previous slide, yeah. but it had the ML AI, and you yeah. said, if you don't have connectivity, you can't do ML AI, yeah. right? Well, where do most organizations originally start their digital transformation journey? Yeah. It's like some CEO heard digital transformation, heard predictive analytics or machine learning, doesn't really know what it is, and says, I want you to start predicting our failures. Yeah. And they throw a bunch of money at it, predict our failures. Yeah. Well, you... Who's here as data scientists? Any data scientists here? Yeah, right there? Okay. By the way, data science is fucking hard. I hate to break the news to you. It is not easy. It is not easy to turn data into human into mimicking human intelligence and software. It's really, really, really hard. And you want to know what data scientists spend most of their time doing? Yeah. Accessing the data and organizing and contextualizing and normalizing the data that they need to train a model. Well, what does UNS do? Well, you have to have access to the data. It's already fully contextualized. It's yeah. already normalized, exactly. right? And the only other thing they got to worry about is throwing away the shit they don't need. That's it. Exactly. And and I think this data science. The, and I apologize. Yeah. I I don't have a filter. So yeah. I, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the idea is the, the consumer. So in in legacy world, um, like you have been saying on YouTube as well, the, the consumers of the data they were SCADA users. Yes. Consumers of the data, they were purpose-built applications created by system integrators for a, a day in time. But now consumers of the data, they are evolving every single day. Yeah? Today, it's data scientists. Tomorrow, might be data scientists on steroids. Yep. There might be somebody else on artificial intelligence on, and that Google Brain popped up on a manufacturing side. So it's just, uh, the consumers are changing. Do you want to go back and redevelop the connectivity again and again and again, or you want to rely on a repeatable foundation of the data itself? And that repeatable foundation bits. Here, here's one of the here's one of the data consumers that I think shocks a lot of people in a digitally mature organization. The one that really blows you away, it's the scheduler. So the scheduler goes in a digital organization, moves from operating in Excel spreadsheets, and that's the one person in the company who cannot get hit by a bus. Right? It, the, the scheduler is like the one person you can't afford to have a heart attack over the weekend. They live in Excel spreadsheets. And then the moment you move to a digital schedule that is driven from the reality on the plant floor so that the scheduler is able to react in real time, they become the number one consumer of data in the IoT platform in that first 12 to 18 months. And nobody is prepared for that. Everyone, the, the end user is always shocked at how the scheduler becomes a data consumer and they are no longer just planning. Exactly. They're, they're, they're processing what it is that they're reading in real time to optimize schedules. And it, it, it blows most people away. Yeah. I mean, honestly. No. Okay, let me, let me uh, go towards a little bit uh, future looking. Where do you see the community should proceed in next one year, next five years? And what's your dream scenario in the next 10 years? One, five, ten. Uh, all right, so over the next year, we are going to focus primarily on how to commoditize data in the cloud. So if you look at how UNS is matured, unified namespaces are matured, like we have clients right now who are, you know, the, the digital transformation is two big steps, right? Step one is become a smart company. That takes three to five years. Step two is plug into a digital supply chain. We have clients who are that mature. So we have a chemical company, a printing manufacturer, and a soda water manufacturer who are all integrated together. But their unified namespaces are unified. So that is the the pigment manufacturer, the chemical company that makes the pigment for the printer, is able to monitor real-time values, process values, uh, tunnel temperatures, relative humidity of the facility, when they are running certain pigments that they sold to that customer. That kind of stuff is hap it happens in my company now, but that more of that's gonna happen in the community because there are more and more, you know, integrators have been doing this now four or five years, and they have more smart companies to work with, okay? But we're going to see 
we've, we saw an explosion in adoption over the last 12 months. Over the next 12 months, what we're going to see is people leveraging cloud to commoditize data a lot more. And Snowflake is really going to play a huge role in that. Okay? Um, and, and, and what I mean by commoditizing data, it's taking the data that manufacturers collect from their plant floor, from their operations, all up and down the stack, and turning that into value they can sell. Okay? You know, it's the Tesla model. Like, I had a conversation with a Microsoft employee yesterday who, he was an architect, and he actually told me he believes Tesla will die next year, you know, and I laughed at him. I mean, I, la I said, I don't expect me to even take you seriously. Yeah, they, they, they had to lay out 10% of their workforce, but that's because of interest rates. No one's borrowing, paying 10% interest rate on a $100,000 car, okay? Once interest rates come down, then car sales go up. But guess what Tesla has increased the sale of? over the last year. Data. I mean, what is a Tesla? It is the most expensive sensor ever manufactured in human history. That's what it is. And believe me, Elon Musk knows that. And the folks at Tesla know that. Commoditizing data is about taking the data that you collect in your manufacturing operation and turning it into value. Can I, do you want me to tell you what value it is? I have no idea. That's your job. To tell. It's your job to figure out how to sell that. We have a... Uh, we have a printer based out of LA. They do um, they do uh, corrugated cardboard. I'm trying to not violate an NDA. Uh, so they, they do corrugated cardboard. It is a highly specialized process. They are currently digitally transforming because what they want to be able to do is sell the optimal manufacturing conditions to their competitors digitally, and that and that's their future. So I see that over the next year. Um, oh, five and ten? I did. Yeah, over, over the next five years, what we're going to see is, I, I, I guarantee what we will see in the next two years is we're going to see a product that comes out. Well, I don't know if it'll be litmus. It might be. Yeah. But we're going to see a product that comes out that will actually work as a completely open, full-stack solution for a manufacturer. That does not exist today. There is no complete, full-stack, open solution. And I do believe we'll see that in the next two years. It, it, it may be UMH in, in, in conjunction with HiveMQ, in conjunction with HiveByte, or it may be something like Litmus, right? Litmus is all those pieces in one, one thing, right? Um, the other thing that we're absolutely going to see, and one of the products that we're absolutely missing in the market, so if you're listening, is the combination of relational database with high performance time series data management. Yeah. That's missing. The, the one-stop shop for relational database, SQL Server, and time scale together, right? That's we're missing that. Okay, uh, it, mo most people try to use Postgres with time scale yeah. to achieve that, but Postgres isn't as easy to work with as SQL or MySQL, right? So, so I, I think that's a product that's missing that we should see in the next couple of years. Over the next ten years, what we're really going to see is an explosion of generative AI. I mean, uh, the, 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 the idea of how we analyze data is going to fundamentally change. And, and, and I want to strongly encourage you, if you have not gone to the Tulip booth, you go to the Tulip booth, you ask for Mason Gildan to give you the demo of the Copilot, the new version of Copilot at Tulip. And you ask them for both demos. So you want demo number one is the one that they're giving to everybody here, and ask them for the new demo. Okay, and the new demo is Copilot baked into the platform, into the Tula platform, and that and that Copilot, literally a developer can walk up to the environment, type into a chatbot, describe this application to me. Yeah. It, um, what what widgets do I have for starting a work order? I want you to generate a component that has a drop down list with that component for creating a work order and a start button that will execute on this data point. Yeah. And it will literally generate it and you can drag it on a screen. Now that's all alpha, yeah. initial, it's not yeah. production ready, yeah. but that's the future. You're going to see it in, in Litmus's platform for sure. I have absolutely no doubt about it. <laughs> that's going to be the big play. The big play is going to be the impact of generative AI as a lever for all of us. Let me say this about AI. There's a lot of hype around AI, right? Yeah. AI is not going to replace people. AI is going to make super people. Industry 5, which we are in the fifth industrial revolution right now, and mark my words, we will trace it all the way back to, no, to November of 2022. The 
Fifth Industrial Revolution started November 2022. Okay? It started. It is the convergence of human and artificial intelligence. And it's already begun. Yeah? Okay? And, and, and if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, I want you to just grab a really smart kid who got 1,400 or higher on his SATs. I want you to bring him to your organization. I want you to give him nothing but a, a chat GBT chatbot and, and your IIoT platform and give him no direction. John McKeon, by the way, is John McKeon here? From GIS, he's already doing this shit. It's great. We had dinner with him the other night, and how he's recruiting new, yeah, new new makes. developers. Yeah, and kids straight off the street, based on nothing but aptitude and tools, and he's turning them in one year into five-year senior engineers. Wow, one year. Yeah, that's what. That's the power of AI. Yes, definitely agree to that. Uh, Tunit will be presenting at Litmus booth as well. I don't know the exact schedule, but do stop by. Um, we'll be exploring how unified namespaces empower those applications. Um, again, once the repeatability is there in terms of data foundation that we are doing with Redmond Edge, or once the data is available in unified namespace, creating artificial intelligence driven applications like that, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. Even if it's on alpha, it's just we are seeing evolution right in front of us our eyes right now. It's yeah. like generate those apps. Um, in terms of, um, like, what do you, like, uh, how would you guide some of the legacy vendors right here? Um, like, what would you tell them um, with the technical ecosystem they have, market share that they have in the market right now? There are some vendors here, they control 25% of industrial market share, 25, 30% of yeah. it. Um, what direction some of those large vendors should be taking and why why they should be taking that direction? Yeah, I would say, uh, so whether you're an OEM or a service provider, so whether you make products or whether you sell labor, yeah. I, the approach is exactly the same. So if I'm a legacy organization, you know, I'm a, say I'm a systems integrator and I'm a traditional CSIA control systems integrator of America association integrator, uh, of industry three approach, I do a lot of automation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, I'm going to do what Toyota did. Toyota created Toyota AI Ventures to break off of the parent of the primary business so that they could innovate. They wanted to, they created Toyota AI Ventures to figure out what the future of Toyota was. You need to do the same thing. You need to decouple the future from the present because the present is a function of the past. If you are a legacy vendor, okay? If I make products, exact same thing. You are not going to make a product of the future. If you're a 40 year old company, you are not gonna make a product of the future uh, operating the way that you've operated for the last 40 years. Uh, what Opto 22 did, right? Opto 22 has been around 50 something years. What they did by fundamentally redefining their product lineup with the Groove Epic is unheard of in our industry. That never happens. That is always some subsidiary, some break off. So the approach should be, I'm gonna invest a little bit of capital in innovation in a separate unit, and it's gonna be my change agents, my disruptive leaders, my transformative leaders. That kid who always tells us that you're stupid for the way you do it, give him his space off on the side yeah. to build you a new business. That, and, it's, and whether that's the OEM, or whether the service provider, the approach is exactly the same. The other thing that I would say is this, approach legacy standards like legacy standards. Because the standards we have today will not exist a decade from now. Okay, um, I've been walking by the security thing over there, okay? Over and over and over again, we're giving security speeches. You know, the way we approach security, this architecture is inherently secure. So all of the rules that we built up in our industry to make us safe are moot when we implement an architecture like this. Yeah. Okay, and so you have to you have to go into the future, understanding the context of the future, not looking at it through the prism of the past. Yeah. Again, I don't want to open up that debate yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna take another half an hour. But yeah, like the. Um, I was going to ask you the question on some of these legacy protocols, but you yeah. answered it very well. Um, like I know we have a few minutes. So um, another thing that we're going to take questions. Too? Yes. Okay. So just in thirty seconds. So okay. uh, at, at a higher level itself, um, that there, are, there are a lot of different things that we, we have been saying. The moment is in a very much correct place. Uh, we are in a moment in time that everything is up for grabs. Everything is up for innovation. Everything is break the mold right now. Yeah. Uh, change the approaches from the legacy vendors to modern approaches, to unified uh, namespace-driven approaches, citizen developer approaches, 
uh, it's time is right now. And uh, what would you say, this last question, what would you say to somebody who graduated yesterday? Say that one more time. Somebody who graduated yesterday and right. as an industrial engineer, yeah. what way does graduated you yesterday? Uh, I would, if you graduated yesterday, you're already, you're already digitally fluent, yeah. but you have no skills, right? So the kids that are coming out of high school right now, you know, I'm, I turned 50 this last week, right? And I happen to be digitally fluent because it's my job. But if I wasn't in the job of being digitally fluent, I, would, I wouldn't be digitally fluent compared to 18, 19 year old kids. Uh, over at AWS, they did a, uh, they, they presented on a, a UNS case study today. What was the name of the company again? Gusto. UK, what is it? Gusto. Gusto. Mm -hmm. So you, you were there, right? Yeah. I, I, the AWS rep was sitting next to me and I, and I was going, how the hell did Gusto pull this off in UK? Like full digital transformation, UNS, AWS stack with high bite. I mean, it, it, it was in, really impressive. And you know what she said to me? She said they were all young. It was a brand new company. Everybody's in their 20s. Nobody had any preconceived notions about how it was supposed to be done. So what they did was they applied their expectations from their childhood on where they were. We were, we were talking about this the other day. And you, he, he, he gave a, an incredible analogy. And I, I used it last night in dinner. You know, I say that young people go into manufacturing facilities today and they feel like they went 50 years into the past. Yeah. And his analogy was, in telling his parent or his family, he said, no, it, it's like, how, do I, how would I go back to 1870 and then explain to people in 1870 what electricity would mean to their life? And that's what young people are facing in manufacturing facilities. They're trying to convince people they're going back to 1870 when there's no electricity and they're trying to make the case for electricity to people who have no concept on what it can do for you. So if you're a young person, number one, recognize that you are digitally fluent but you have no skills whatsoever, okay? Number two, learn how to code. You better learn Python. You don't have, you're not gonna have to write code from scratch anymore but you still need to know how code works. Everyone needs to know how code works, everybody. Number three, containerization, containerization, containerization. If you don't know Docker, if you don't know Docker Compose, you don't know Kubernetes, you are illiterate. You are illiterate, okay? That, that is my recommendation to you, okay? And, and, the end. and follow your passion. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Thanks yeah. a lot, Parker. Yeah. And let's open up a question. Yeah. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. But what if you have the skills, but not uh, the company around it with the digital fluency in there? So if you work for a company that is not digitally fluent, yeah. change, I, nobody ever likes this answer. Mm -hmm. okay. Change jobs. Right? <laughs> if you're in an organization who doesn't get it, change jobs. If it means you got to move, you got to move. Okay. I, nobody ever likes that answer. But do not languish in an organization that is going to die. Do not languish in an organization that is going to die. And let me say this. What you could do, and we've done this. We've been, am I allowed to mention the... No? Okay. Uh, so I, I'll quickly tell you this. There was, a, there was a large tier one automotive supplier, one of the largest in the world, second largest in the world. There, a subsidiary there has had 50,000 employees, no digital fluency. They came to us and asked us to train them in an enterprise training program. And so we trained literally, we, I think in four different languages, we did like eight modules teaching digital fluency to the whole organization. 50,000 people, including how their jobs would change. And then the parent company, which has like 150,000 employees, said, holy shit, that really transformed how the organization, just education. Industry four, digital transformation starts with education. Right? If, you're, if you happen to be the organization that's already got people who are highly digitally fluent, you don't have to teach. But the most organizations have to teach. So what I would say is, is if you can educate your employer, you can do it this way. Ask them what their digital strategy is. Go to the highest ranking person that you can talk to and say, what is our digital strategy? And when they say, what is that? You say, it is a three sentence statement that says why data is our primary commodity. And if they look at you with a deer in headlights, run. Go get into the dog. Nobody ever likes that answer, but it, it is the answer. Yeah. Thank you. And well. what, what I would, I would uh, briefly add is, um, like it was as a company, we have been fortunate enough to work with those type of uh, leaders itself. Like the CIO scheme, uh, they treat their data as a, as a next asset. 
is data is their asset. If you talk to those leaders, leaders, they are like, I need the data right now. What do I need it for? Everything. Yeah. Uh, if you if you are talking with if you are working with that person, the um, opportunities are countless. If data, they, they want to go back to pen and paper all the time, then none of these things that we are talking or walk around and whatever we are talking is completely useless. Right. And let's say you have let's say there's a champion internally. There's a small contingent who gets it, okay? So then the question is, where do you start? Yeah. And the answer is, you make a team out of that small contingent, you pick one specific business problem, you define a strategy, an architecture, minimum technical requirements, you get yourself an IIoT platform, and you solve that business problem. And then as a team, you go to the rest of the business and go, do you want this? Yeah. And if they say yes, then you know you're on the right track, and they will give you the money to scale. But if there's nobody there, you're wasting your time. And if you're a young person and you're saying, I'm just the one guy, how do I do this? The answer is solve your problems digitally. Your peers will see that you are more efficient, that you are, this is how my career was built. Every engineer, I worked in engineering groups, I would build the ecosystem I needed to make my job easier and it made them look bad. And then they wanted to do whatever it is. I was, where did you get that? I want that too. And then my supervisor wanted it. It spreads like a, not a disease, but like, you know, like a smile. It spreads yeah. like a smile. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, like just last month, um, our VP of Customer Success, Mark Mecca, he was here yeah. as well. He, he gave me one of the like very fantastic statistics. So every person who used Litmus Edge in only in their career, uh, they got promoted to Industry 4.0 head. There is a 4.5 out of five percent criteria right now, it's like ninety percent people. Why? I, I say I can't. I can't tell you the number of VPs I've made from engineer to VP, yeah. like jumping three levels, four levels, because you become the de facto expert. And let, let me say one other thing before we finish. Yeah, we do a digital transformation maturity assessment that we built, and that maturity assessment is based on ten industry four pillars. Okay. How did we build that mechanism to score organizations on their digital maturity? We started with Tesla and we reverse engineered them. We started with Amazon and we reverse engineered them. We started with Volkswagen North America and we reverse engineered them and we combined it together. Yeah. Why? Because they're the three most digitally mature companies on the planet. By the way, Volkswagen North America is more digitally mature than Apple is. And the reason why is because Apple is not digitally integrated to their suppliers in China. Okay, that's the read, that's the fundamental difference. Do you know when we do that digital transformation maturity assessment, what the, when we ask people, what are you good at, what are you bad at, and what is missing? Okay, do you know what 91% of the respondents say what is missing? 91%, there are 1,400 companies in that survey, 10,000 individual surveys, 91% gave the same answer of what's missing. Does anybody know what it is? Access to the data they need to do their job. 91%. If I'm a supervisor, it's I have no vision, I have no visibility into current state. I gotta walk the plant floor to see which machines are running, which ones aren't. If I'm the general manager, I have no idea where I am relative to plan. If it's the quality people, I have no idea when my next sample is up. If, if, if it's the guy who works in the lab, it's I have no idea when I'm supposed to take, I'm supposed to, to provide the next report. Yeah. The, the answer, the fundamental problem that everyone is facing is access to the data they need. And if you want to know where you get the data that they need? All the Excel spreadsheets that they've built to do their jobs. And so when you are talking internally, ask people for their spreadsheets. <laughs> Those spreadsheets will tell you what the problems are. Okay, one more okay. question. Yeah. Hi, Walker. And um, Jacek uh, from Fanuc. Uh, I believe, uh, I think uh, I sourced it from you that uh, successful uh, IoT transformation uh, depends on the engagement of the, all the people in the plant. Uh, I agree, completely agree with that. However, what, what I've seen in my, my experience, it's uh, quite challenging to engage the, the simple machine operators or ro uh, robotic system operators. How to do that? What was your experience? You, you must, this is a very important point here. It, for executives, um, implementing digital transformation must be the most expedient path. Okay, it can't be harder to become digitally transformed than to stay the way I am. For the operator, you know how you get operator engaged? You make their job easier. 
So as, as a digital transformation specialist, your focus has to be on the customer experience. I was talking about this earlier. If you are not solving the end user's problem, you are wasting your fucking time. Seriously, it's, it doesn't matter how great of a coder you are. It doesn't matter how awesome the tech is. If you are not solving their problem, you build garbage. And the way you get them engaged is by solving their problems. And I'll give you a quick example. For a big oil and gas customer, I used to do this. I would go in front of organizations, I would ask this question. I want you to be thinking about a problem, all of you, everybody in here, a problem you've been trying to solve for a day, a week, a month, a year, 10 years, and your job function, you have not been able to solve yet, okay? It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be digital. It doesn't have to be process related, just a problem. And then I would give my presentation, look something like that, and then I would go around the room and I would look for a problem I could solve in 10 minutes or less. And I was in front of uh, um, Laredo Petroleum, and I always ask for operators to be in the room, and I want the biggest jerk. I always ask for the biggest jerk. I, I ask for the caveman, the citizen against virtually everything, the one who's going to say I'm an idiot. And, and, I, at, and this, I get to this guy in the room, and I say, what's your problem? And he goes, you know, we have all this fancy tech, you know, and everybody spends all this money on this fancy tech, and I get these text messages in the middle of the night that I got a high tank alarm out in the middle of East Bumfuck, New Jersey, and he's like, and I got to dispatch a pumper out there and pay double time because it's a Sunday night uh, for a high tank alarm. And that guy goes out there and he tells me, you know what, buddy? The, the fluid was flowing in there slow, so slow, I could have gone out there two days from now. He goes, I don't need to know if I have a high tank alarm. I need to know how much time I have left in my tank. How many of you, process engineers, controls engineers, create a variable that is time in tank? The answer is hardly anybody. And what we did using ignition, actually, we used ignition to quickly write an expression that converted the volume of the tank, inflow, outflow, and the level of the tank into time remaining in the tank. 10 minutes, solved this problem, he was no longer a caveman. That's how you do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Yeah. And, and there was one over here. Got it. Okay. You pass the mic down? Good. Um, so my question is a, a little bit around network, actually. Network? And, um, how important is it in asset visibility and creating a similar concept to UNS um, to define um, like a naming convention for your network? And how does that support your network? How important is that to support your network? Yeah, obviously, it's critically important. Yes. Okay. Um, you don't start with creating a naming convention for your network, okay? Um, because the goal is to not involve IT in the beginning. Okay, so, and, and IT is the one who's gonna define the naming convention. The goal is to not involve them. By the way, digital transformation always starts on the plant floor. It always starts in OT, and you always want it to be isolated to OT, and you don't want to involve IT unless you have to. So you want to make sure you're doing something that doesn't require IT's approval, okay? In the proof of concept, only the proof of concept, which is why the case over there with the 5G case is an important game changer because you're basically landing infrastructure on the plant floor IT doesn't own that gives you the ability to solve the problem. But the answer is it's critically important, but it comes down the road. And honestly, in, in most cases, we're not even defining network naming conventions until 18, 24 months in. Yeah. And another thing is, um, uh, like when you, when you pick that fight, um, like starting from a network reorganization point of view, um, it becomes like I, I have this CMM system, or I have this asset management system, I have this hierarchy built out in this uh, four other um, IP, IP management systems that I have, IT systems that I have. Which one should I use? Why am I supposed to use UNS when I already have this hierarchy built out right here? They'll point to Maximo. Am I, all the network is organized right here. And the answer is because Maximo's got an asset ID, the ERP's got an asset ID, the CMMS has got an asset ID, which asset ID do I use? Yeah. Well, you've got to use the one that's a single source of truth in the unified namespace that puts all three of them together. So if we say ERP asset ID is the master ID, now I have to be able to join that ID against the ID and the CMMS. Well, where do I get it from? I get it from the, the unified namespace. Yeah. This, this is the contextualization, the coalescence, and the normalization of all events in your business, and the master data models. And when we opened up a private data like four or five months ago, called it was UNS, 
the uh, first three users that we got, they asked the exact same question. Yeah. That uh, rather than doing that, can I organize modems and my network switches there? Uh, we were like, okay, interesting question. Why don't you have that right now? But then they said, yes, there are many different things that exist, but for the exact reason where I don't have a singular single source of code right now. And if there's a big question, I I want to make sure that nobody has a question that they that goes unanswered. One last. <laughs> was this valuable? It was valuable. Okay, awesome. That's it. Okay, appreciate you, brother. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming here.